Hi, welcome to the question and answer session for teaching primary science chemistry. I hope you've enjoyed the last three weeks and that the course has, has helped you in uh, developing the chemistry aspect within your school. The first question that we have today is from Catherine, who had asked, um, how do you try and think about all the misconceptions before the lesson and plan for these? I think Catherine is an NQT by the tone of her question, and it can be very difficult to, to really anticipate those misconceptions if you have never taught the subject or the topics before. Um, there is help out there and there are some really great resources that we can actually get our hands on these days that can help us uh, to discover those misconceptions. And then what you'll find, Catherine, is as you're teaching that um, you'll find more and more misconceptions that you come across with the children as you go along. Just keep doing those mini assessments as you go along, little plenaries, uh, concept cartoons, the Explorify, and these will bring lots of the misconceptions to light. Some of the resources that you can get your hands on, though, um, are things such as this. So this here is a, uh, a knowledge matrix which has come from the plan assessment website. These are fab and they're absolutely free. There is tons of good resources on there. And I'd really um, suggest that you go and have a good look around on that website. Now, in that booklet, um, it goes through each of the topics for each of the year groups and you get lots of good information on there, including a section that gives you all the mis not all the misconceptions, but some of the most common misconceptions that you might come across with the children. So I'd say that's my that would be my go to document, I think, for looking at um, a misconceptions at the start of a topic. As well as that, um, on this course, we've talked about the book Misconceptions in Primary Science by Michael Allen. That's another great one to get your hands on. And not only does that uh, talk about some of the, the misconceptions that you might come across with the children and actually some misconceptions that adults and teachers might have as well. Um, it also talks to you about why that misconception might be there and how we can address it. And finally, we have a really great resource that's on the STEM learning website as well, um, which is the Nuffield Primary Science Teachers um, Guides, which was from the space research um, project that they did. Now, they are quite old documents, but they are still very relevant to the science that we're teaching today. And that research was all about children's ideas, children's thoughts. Um, so lots of the misconceptions came out in those documents. And again, uh, just like the, uh, the, the misconceptions in primary science book, it talks to you about why the children might have those ideas and, and how to address them. So it's well worth uh, just having it dig out of that resource as well. Um, our second question came from Jennifer. And Jennifer asked, um, when it is dissolved, how do I describe or name the state of the original material? For example, um, sugar dissolved into water. Um, is it solid, liquid gas dissolved into a solution? Well, if we're talking scientifically, the correct terms are it's a solute. So the solute is dissolved in the solvent. Um, children struggle with vocabulary at the best of times, you know, when we overlearn and things like that. Um, and I know I always have to look up which one am I talking about? Solute, solvent. Um, and I've been doing this for a long time. So I'm not, yes, you absolutely introduce those words to the children, but maybe um, talk about what they're actually seeing, what it is, um, and what has actually happened. So let's, let's imagine we've got some salt and we've we pop it into the water and it's dissolved and we can no longer see any salt in our water. We've created a solution there. But what has actually happened is the salt has split into its individual particles and then the water molecules have surrounded that salt. So we've actually got the dissolving has happened by sort of breaking apart the particles. Um, then when we evaporate off the water, what then happens is the individual particles of the salt then have time to form back together again. Now, I was talking to some colleagues about this and I said, so is that why sometimes we get what I call fluffy salt? And that's just where the, they've reorganised um, themselves, but they haven't organised themselves into the same way as when we poured the salt in. They've, they've organised themselves more haphazardly, but they still salt. It's just in a different form. And I was told that if you evaporate it off really, really quickly at the water, you actually get very, very tiny particles of salt. Um, and if you evaporate more slowly, they, they form larger crystals. So that's something that you might want to do with your children. Our next question came from Prianga, who asked how to explain there are different gases in the air. 
Now, actually in primary science um, into the English national curriculum, the key learning that the children need to get is that there are three states of matter. So we're looking at liquids, solids and gases. At this stage, we're not necessarily breaking that down into the different gases that you would find in the air. Um, within the curriculum, though, there is chance that children will come across some of the individual gases. When looking at plants, uh, you may be talking about oxygen and carbon dioxide if you're talking about photosynthesis, um, which we may do a little bit with the children um, as they're in year three and possibly in year five as well. Um, you might also talk to the children about oxygen and carbon dioxide if you're talking about bodily processes. Um, maybe if you're talking about the uh, exercise, respiratory system, any of those sorts of things, you might end up talking about those gases as well. Um, but generally, the, in, the, in primary school, there isn't the need to actually break it down into the gases names. That, uh, that type of learning is introduced in year seven, uh, where the children are taught the four main gases, which are nitrogen, oxygen, argon and carbon dioxide. Now, there are some different ways that you can introduce those to the children. Um, I've seen a lovely idea that's used with sweets, uh, where you might have different coloured sweets, which represent the different gases that are in the air. And the number of sweets that you have is uh, representative of the amount of gas that you'd have in the air, so the percentages of it. And actually those can be mixed up and then you can sort them out and make lovely little pie charts with them to, to just show that there are different ones that, that are all around us. But actually at secondary school, the way that they start to do it is through testing. So they will do gas tests for carbon dioxide and for oxygen. And they do that both with inhaled and exhaled air to show that there is a, a difference between the two. Now, these, these investigations that they do, they do involve chemical solutions and glowing splints. So they are obviously not suitable for the primary classroom. Okay, um, our final question was asked by um, a couple of different people, actually. Um, the first part was, when should we start to introduce things like atoms and molecules? At what age? And then the second is, how do you introduce and what's a good way? Um, I personally, although they don't appear anywhere in the English primary science curriculum, molecules and atoms, um, I have always brought them in and started talking with them with the children when we've looked at states of matter. It just makes sense if you're talking about solids, liquids, gases, then talk about what actually makes them different. So we can observe, observe, you know, um, here's some ice, here's some water, and, and you know, here's some, some uh, water vapour. We can see those three states. Um, but what does it mean to the children? You know, why are they different? Why is it when we when we put um, some water in the freezer, it freezes? What What's actually happening? And some children will be starting to think about that. So it just makes sense. So when you're introducing your states of matter, start talking about, well, actually, water is made up from lots of little tiny molecules. There's some absolutely beautiful videos uh, that you can get where they talk about, you know, zooming and zooming and zooming to that the, the head of a pin and this is how many molecules you can fit on and things like that. Um, it is quite hard. It is modelling. Uh, models aren't always the most ideal thing because children then can get that idea in their head. I know for very many years I imagined all molecules were round balls because that's what I'd been introduced to at school. You know, we draw them as round balls. And it wasn't until I was an adult and I started thinking, mm, you know, when someone actually asked my, and questioned my thinking about it, I started thinking, oh, well, maybe that's not quite right. So as long as we talk to the children, this is just a model, this is what we imagine, you know, um, to put it into our head, this is what's going on. But I got um, my class, you know, we, we stood um, all the class together and we stood really, really close together with our shoulders touching and every bit. And then we wiggled you know, <laughs> um, and talked about that's what happens in a solid. If we're really tightly packed, we, we can't move about, we can't freely move. Then this is what a solid looks like if we if we magnify it right down. Then we sort of spread out a little bit further, but still sort of touching and moved a bit more. And that we, we talked about that was the model of a liquid. And then they sort of had free range around the classroom, and then they were modeling being a gas. Um, I've also done it with balls, so like ball pool balls, um, and again, arrange them in a tight, compact uh, space. It's quite hard to do a solid unless you've got something to put them into, but then it kind of resembles a liquid. Um, 
But you know, if you put the balls into um, a uh, like an aquarium and you can tightly pack them, um, and then you can say, okay, well, this is like a liquid. It takes the shape of the container. Um, uh, they love doing the gas because then they just get to throw them at each other. Um, and um, I, I recently saw someone commenting that they've used cubes, so uh, multi-link cubes, to build the solid. Um, it's a little bit more tricky to build to the liquid, but just placing them in again into a bowl or something like that show that they take the shape of the container they're in. Um, there's lots of different ways, but again, modeling isn't always perfect and you do need to have that conversation with the children. But I don't think it's wrong to introduce it at primary, just so they've got that in the back of their head that this is what we're talking about. So thank you for your questions for this Q&A. Uh, Sarah and I have really enjoyed looking at them and um, finding the answers. They do challenge us a little bit, some of them. Um, please, um, if you've enjoyed this course, come back. Um, we have other courses that are available fu through Future Learn. Primary Science Getting Started, which we look at all the working scientifically elements of the primary science curriculum. And we have upcoming um, the Primary Science Physics course. So keep your eye open for that one.